We always talk about what it's like to go to space and the effects on the human body. When you are weightless, your muscles aren't experiencing any gravity, your bones aren't experiencing any gravity, and they start to shed material because you don't need them anymore. And there are ways you can get around this. You exercise like crazy and you can minimize the impact on the human body. But there are some other issues. Your fluids redistribute around the body. And one of the biggest dangers is that you have problems with your vision. And many astronauts report that they have trouble seeing. They have to wear, start wearing glasses while they're in space. But to figure out how much this is happening to an astronaut's eyes requires pretty much surgery to measure the intracranial pressure on their eyes. But researchers at the University of Western Australia have developed a technique so that they can measure the pressure on the eyes non invasively, essentially using a video camera to track changes in their eyesight. They've done experiments in the lab. And the next step is to take this to parabolic flight and eventually to take this to space. So my guest today is Daniel Obreshko, who is a researcher at University of Western Australia. He's actually an astrophysicist, but worked on the project with medical researchers. And he's here to explain what the problem is, what their technique and solution is and what the future might hold for helping astronauts maintain their vision when they go to space. All right, here's the interview. Being on a parabolic flight is an absolutely wonderful experience. First off, uh, you sort of get into that plane and it feels a little bit like a spacecraft. Uh, it looks nothing like the interior of a normal plane. The people that are with you on a parabolic flight are often astronauts that get trained to go up to the ISS. They are um, test pilots, you really get that uh, sort of experience of being immersed in a space flight mission. Then the plane takes off pretty much like a normal civil passenger plane. You are seated in a seat at the front and back of the plane. And once the plane is in steady cruise flight, you, you get out of your seat into a huge open space where the scientific, scientific experiments are. Now, as cruise altitude is established, the pilot will tell you it takes one minute for the first parabola. Now, if this is your first parabola in your life, you get, uh, you get very tense at this stage. It's a bit like being on top of a roller coaster and now you know any second it's just going to release you. So what then happens, uh, there's a little countdown and at the end of that countdown, uh, you experience a sudden pull down because the plane is now pitching its nose up for the injection into the parabola. You get extra centrifugal forces, which give you roughly twice the normal gravity. So you really pull down uh, and you, you feel that you, you might get a little bit of dizziness in your brain because of the lack of blood. And then there's another countdown. And when that countdown is done, roughly 20 seconds, the pilot essentially turns off the engine. And so the plane no longer flies like a plane, but it's just a piece of mass that has been thrown into the air and by its own inertia now follows a parabolic trajectory. And everything that's inside the plane is immediately in microgravity or essentially no gravity at all. Uh, you, of course, experience this transition from hypergravity into no gravity at all very strongly. The first feeling you get is your stomach sort of lifting up. And uh, it's normally a lot of noise in the plane because everybody makes some funny noise when that happens. And then a second later, you realize that your stomach hasn't moved at all and that nothing's wrong. You feel to the contrary, a very special feeling. It's just a, a very free feeling. And you realize, at least I realize uh, every time that up and down don't make sense anymore. You sort of see the objects that used to be down and the objects that used to be up, but there's no sense to that term anymore. And when you push yourself off the sides of the plane, then you normally start spinning, but it doesn't ever feel like you are spinning. It feels like suddenly the whole plane is turning around you. Because if there's no gravity, then the only reference you have is your own body. Mm. And so that's a very strange experience. Everybody but it's different a than, like, I imagine, like, what it's like to be swimming and to be 
roughly weightless when you're under the water. Yeah. But it's different because you're still experiencing gravity even though you're swimming under the water. But then I also think about what it's like to to be on some kind of amusement park ride where you're falling yeah. and it's just terrifying. And exactly. so Exactly. And so it's yeah. weird to me that your brain in in initially I guess freaks out and then it figures that everything is fine and that this is fine. Exactly. So if wow. you are in an amusement park, if you are on a roller coaster also if you do a, a skydive you see that you are falling because the, the whole world around you is still and you are the one that's moving down. In the plane, you don't have a reference point. In the experimental section, there are no windows and you just have no gravity. And there's nothing to be, you know, there's no reference point that tells you you should be scared. If you take a trip to the cockpit, you can do that in this plane, and, and you look what the thing looks like from there, you recover the terrifying feeling quite quickly. Because you now see that that plane is first shooting right up into the sky, all you see is blue sky, and a few seconds later it's diving down towards the ocean, and suddenly all you see is ocean. And all the alarm bells go on in the cockpit, essentially telling the pilots that there is an emergency, emergency situation. <laughs> right, right. And, and they have to recover that plane. Yeah. By the way, and when I said, <laughs> sorry, when I, well, said I was going to say, that, is it appropriately yeah. named the Vomit Comet? Uh, yeah, that's right. So the Vomit Comet is actually a term that was, um, well, that that got coined with the US equivalent of the plane that I was on. I was on the European Airbus A300 uh, CRG. And the US version is a slightly smaller plane. And it does one parabola after the other without including steady flights in between. So it only ever goes hypergravity, zero gravity, hypergravity, zero gravity, which is very oh. uncomfortable. Uh, the European plane gives you two minutes of normal cruise flight in between. And yeah, it turns out that that's a quite, quite a good measure against the vomiting. Um, basically, it really, it really goes to sh this whole vomiting is caused by a basically your brain gets overloaded with confusing information. Your inner ear that normally tells you the gravity vector goes crazy. It doesn't say, it says there's no gravity. Your eyes see that nothing has changed. There is still an up and down to the eye. Your sense of touch when you sit on your chair tells you where, you know, where the bottom is. Um, that has disappeared. So there's this different information coming into your brain and what the brain concludes is that um, it must have been poisoned or something and it wants, <laughs> wants to eject the bad stuff from the body. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and like I've heard that like astronauts, when they go to space, yeah, they they don't know whether they're going to get sick. That, no, that exactly right. Each time and each time it's brand new because if it's been a few months or even, you know, several years since they've been to space, their brain f figures this out each time brand yeah. new or fresh that but i didn't realize that, that was like i thought it was just like motion sickness like but it sounds like it's just such an alien experience that your your yeah. brain just loses it literally um that's amazing so let's so let's talk about what what does weightlessness do to the human body so there are, there are these short-term effects that your body gets confused, it feels sick. Uh, you may have a, um, a issue to feel your own body wet because there's no more um, gravitational force, but your inertial mass is still there. That gives you some confusion. You, you, you struggle to move. A lot of people start moving like, like frogs in, in the air uh, uh, to sort of try and move and you know, obviously don't, do, don't get anywhere. So these are very short term effects, literally um, first uh, sort of seconds, maybe minutes of microgravity. Then you normally get into a phase where you are just fine. You, you learn how to live in microgravity and you can live very comfortably for many days, even weeks in microgravity. And only then 
do these long-term effects kick in because ultimately our body, every living being's uh, body on the earth is built for gravity. And the range of gravity on the earth is extremely small. There's a constant level of gravity essentially anywhere on the earth within less than a percent. So our bodies really aren't made to deal with any variations in, in gravity. Uh, for instance, one thing that your body has learned is to pump up blood to your brain. Because we normally sit or stand upright, there's a third of the day where we lie flat, but two thirds we are in an upright position. And a lot of work has to go into making sure that there's enough blood and other fluids as well in your brain. Now that function keeps being active if you are in microgravity, even though you don't need that extra force that pumps it out. So you see that in astronauts that they are, their heads normally start swelling up. There's a, a famous pictures of uh, Scott Kelly uh, he, comparing him post and uh, pre-flight. Uh, he's been in space for, for more than a year uh, continuously. And so you, you see that enormous change. Uh, now, this, this is one of the effects, and I might talk a little bit more about what that does inside the brain and the eyes. Yep. Another yeah, we definitely effect, want to talk about that. It, yeah, I'm sure we're going to go there. Another thing is that you don't need as much bone and not as much muscle than you need on the ground. Obviously, you basically don't need legs at all in microgravity. <laughs> your, your body realizes and starts disintegrating and wow. not replacing your bone mass. So you lose bone mass and you lose muscle tissue. And if that's for several months in a row, even more, more than a year in a row, then uh, you have serious uh, struggles when you come back to a normal And, and what's the rate? Field. Like I've heard it's like a, like a couple of percent a month. Like it's wearing away your bones yeah. and your muscles quite quickly yeah. without any intervention. That, that is right. I mean, our bodies are just very efficient at adjusting to what we need it's like you train a lot you build up muscle there's nobody who seriously goes to the gym who doesn't build up muscle and the same way if you don't move your muscles they just decline because it's carrying around weight for nothing for no reason so our body is quite efficient in making sure that the muscle is where it has to be um, so yeah, this is just a consequence of a well working system and it's totally systematic there's no astronaut that goes for a year to space and comes back with the same bone mass and the same muscle tissue. So it's clearly something that we have to address if we were to ever fly to Mars. Now, remember Mars, you have to be in Mars gravity on the flight for say eight months. And then you are on Mars's surface, that's a third of the gravity, that's no good either. And then you come back after one and a half year on Mars. So you sort of three years essentially of, of very weak gravity. And the, and there are methods to deal with most of the issues that astronauts face. I mean, you see them working out all the time on the, on the space station, both doing cardiovascular activity as well as doing weight training. And that's just to prevent, can they stop it? Or is it, are they still losing some muscle and bone mass despite working out for like three hours a day? Yeah, uh, that, that is a good question. To, to be frank, I don't fully know the stats. I mean, they, they cannot fully stop it. I know that much. But with a lot of workout, you can have a very significant slowdown of this muscle disintegration. The thing is, your body feels gravity when you are asleep. Okay, and the muscles feel that gravity when you are asleep. So all the time, your muscles get told, you know, keep, keep, keep fit, keep fit. You still need to keep that body together in, in a normal level of gravity. So if you have three hours a day of hard workout, it's your gravity. You sort of can compensate for some of the muscle and bone loss, but not, not entirely. Hmm. And so what are the, the things that we can't fix right now? So. One of the things we cannot fix is SANS, which stands for Space Flight Associated Neuroocular Syndrome. It's a bit of a mouthful uh, to name a condition whereby your blood in, gets pumped into your brain at an excessive rate in microgravity, 
and that in, um, increases the blood pressure and the pressure of the cerebrospinal fluid, which is just the fluid that you have in your brain and in your spine. So those fluids, those bodily fluids, uh, have an increased pressure in the head when you are in microgravity. One consequence of this is that the brain structure and the structure of the eyes can change, and it does so in two-thirds of the astronauts on long-haul flights. Uh, very concretely, it makes, it causes the nerve, the optic nerve that goes into the eye to swell and the back of the eye to get flattened. Hmm. That causes your vision to become blurry. Sometimes so is, the syndrome... Is this kind of similar to like glaucoma? Uh, that's right. That's right. It's a similar. It's a similar kind of phenomenon. Because it's like an increase in the pressure in the yeah. eye, changing the shape of yeah. it and causing long-term damage. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that this this syndrome is also sometimes of colloquially called space blindness. Right. It's uh, vision deterioration that you experience, and it can be very serious. It can be very serious. In most cases, it can be, it, it recovers when you get back to the ground, but sometimes it has lasting long-term effects as well. And we really don't know what the magnitude of this syndrome will be if you are for three years in mm -hmm. gravity rather than one year. It's considered one of the most serious challenges going to Mars by, by NASA. And like you know, many because, astronauts have permanent damage to their eyesight that lasts for the rest of their lives, even after they've come back from their from their flights. That is right. That is right. Uh, it, it's clearly something that's uh, that's very significant, and it's interesting because you know your eyes, they just experience the brain fluid pressure that everyone experiences when they lie down flat. That is the it, if your body is in zero gravity but upright, so to speak, then uh, you just have the same pressure difference between the head and the rest of the body that you have in normal gravity when you lie flat. And so, you know, it's curious that that little difference can cause an eye damage if you are constantly exposed to it, but, but it, is, it is so. And, you know, we have to find countermeasures. Uh, but right. before we found countermeasures, we have to find ways to detect that that's happening. Right. And, and, and I guess, and this is leading into the research that, that they're working at, at at your university. That's right. That's right. So it, it's generally a challenge to detect uh, the, or to measure the pressure inside the brain in that cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, basically, the only direct ways to do so is to somehow go in with a pressure sensor. You can, you can drill a hole in the skull, a burr hole, <laughs> small, a very small hole, and right. you insert the pressure sensor. Uh, I mean, that, those holes are also sometimes used to release pressure from, right. from the fluid if you, if you have a, a bad accident. You can also do a lumbar puncture, so insert the needle into the spine, to measure the pressure there, same fluid. Yeah, none, none uh, of this sounds like a good idea in space. No, it, uh, well, uh, that, that's right. And, you know, fortunately, there is a natural or two natural holes into the brain, and that's, that's the eyes. Uh, the eyes is, eyes is essentially uh, part of the, the brain system, and uh, there's a physical hole into the brain. So now, if the brain fluid has an increased pressure, that pressure will will be felt by the retina. And the question is, how can you, by observing the retina, measure that pressure? And the idea there is that when you look at the veins in the retina, small blood vessels, you see the pulse end. And it's your, your heartbeat that is visible. So all you need to do is uh, have a special camera that, that looks at your eye and, and you will see that nice little pulsation of the, of the veins. If the pressure from the brain onto the back of the eye increases, that pulsation can slightly change. It can change in, in various ways. The most simple way it changes is just the amplitude of that pulsation. There are more interesting effects as well. The speed at which waves propagate through these vessels can also be affected. Um, 
Anyway, that's where the research starts. It's observing the retina and using that information from the vein pulsations as a key to determine the pressure of the brain fluid. Now, this study that is led at this university uh, has found very significant effects, measurable effects, uh, where we can essentially determine the brain fluid pressure by observing the eye. Now, to do this, we, we didn't do this in my goal gravity. We had patients on a tilt table where you sort of make them go upright and then you, you, know, you strip them down on the table and you can change the, their inclination, which basically changes the relative height difference between the heart and the head. And so that causes this pressure. You can change the pressure as you like, and then you can uh, observe how the retina pulsations change. Uh, of course, this is all done in you know, very fine-tuned laboratory settings and you can have all your complicated gear and your optic table next to it, etc. Now the next, so that's a very, very low level of um, uh, TRL, if you will, technology readiness level. So it's now a, a question of taking that nice piece of basic research and making it applied, uh, applicable in space even. So, and, yeah, and so you and so do you, you've got a chance to test this on the on the parabolic flight? Uh, yes, potentially so. So it's clearly something we we are we are working on. So the next step now is to develop a handheld portable device where instead of having a whole setup with computers etc., you have a small device that includes the camera and the software and the hardware to do the analysis etc. And you, you know, it's like a sort of a, uh, yeah, a kind of a handheld pistol that you, that you put to the eye and, and it takes a movie and then does the analysis for you and tells you something about uh, the brain fluid pressure. So that, that would be the idea to, to have such a thing. That's what we are currently developing. And so what do you imagine like the version, the final version that goes to space? What will that, will that be like a, I don't know, I'm thinking like one of those infrared thermometers that one astronaut will point at another astronaut's retina or will they put on like a pair of yeah. glasses or like goggles that will be recording footage of both of their eyes? I think you basically, you basically hit it with those two ideas. It's, it's going to be either of the two. Having something that stripped to the head might might be preferable because you you probably need to take um, you know a few seconds maybe half a minute worth of a of a video or two to get enough statistics on the on the pulsations of the retina. So yeah, something that is more or less stable to the head would, would do the job. It could also be a device that's attached to say the ISS and you just go there and put your put your head right. in there. You know, yeah, I mean, I sort of think about your... getting my eyes tested. And they do yeah. a bunch of the tests, right? They do, they do like not only just check to see if I'm, you know, I need glasses, but also they check the, the shape of, or the condition of the blood vessels. They check for glaucoma and I'm kind of strapped in to this machine that's holding my face very tight to make sure they can get good, good footage of it. Um, and so, I mean, it's just gotta be night and day because like right now the diagnosis, like the astronauts come home and then people will will examine their eyes. I'm not sure how many spinal taps the astronauts are getting, but they are, and it's too late because they're already back home and they're already back in Earth gravity. And so you could go from no tests currently to daily, hourly, like when you're doing a very intensive series of experiments, you could be testing them nonstop. Yes, uh, I mean, in principle, you could do it as much as needed. I'm not sure what the medical recommendation would be, how often you need to do it, but it's absolutely harmless. You could you could do it every five minutes if you if you wish. Right, right. Yeah, uh, I, I'm just yeah. thinking of you know if they're you know see yeah. what happens after they eat, see what happens when they're moving around, when they're exercising, see what happens, like see if any of these are con preconditions. Because I mean, like I wonder if you get to this point that you can actually examine the astronauts and then you know who suffered worse effects when they got back down to earth you could know whether or not an astronaut 
their eyesight is deteriorating too quickly and what might be causing it but it, but even if it's if it is too much then you can bring them home for example or maybe you can find somebody who's very resilient to it and you know that they'll be okay to fly to mars for three years exactly i mean of course you notice pretty quickly once the deterioration of the vision starts the astronauts notice themselves that suddenly they can't read properly anymore uh, the idea here is to rather than detecting the symptoms, detecting the cause before they cause the symptoms, and then do something about it. Now, bringing them back, of course, is, is always an option when they are in, in Earth orbit on a flight to Mars, there's no, there's no hope. Uh, but you could imagine that, for instance, a spaceship has a, a centrifuge, for instance, that allows to create gravity, uh, but that centrifuge might not be large enough for the whole crew to go in. And, you know, you have to select who has to go, how much time into that centrifuge. That, that would be a scenario where it makes total sense to know who struggles the most, most with this. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I've, I've reported on some like micro centrifuges in the past. Yeah. There was a... There's a team out of, I think, John Hopkins University, maybe. Anyway, and they had developed a, a like a little spinning chair that you could sit in and it would fit within the rocket fairing of like a Falcon 9. And so it, was, it would fit within a five meter fairing and it would just spin you very quickly to give you artificial gravity. It was yes. uncomfortable, <laughs> and, but you were able to become accustomed to it. Yeah. But it worked okay. And so yeah. you can imagine that maybe, yeah, you have one of these little centrifuges attached to the spaceship and everyone's getting their eyesights checked and someone goes, oh, you better go spend another hour in the in the spin cycle. Right. Yes, exactly. I mean, you know, it, since we talk about uh, generating gravity uh, or artificial gravity, I mean, it's well, it's, this is sometimes called artificial gravity when you use inertial forces to mimic gravity. Now, in, in modern physics, in general relativity, those two things are totally identical. It's the uh, equivalence principle. So uh, I just like to call it creating gravity. Uh, and you can, do so, you can do so with inertial forces. So inertial forces are the forces that you experience when you are accelerated in any way or form relative to an inertial frame. At the most simple form to do this is centrifugal forces. So you spin yourself in a, in a wheel and you experience those forces that pull you out. They are equivalent to gravity. Now, if the, if the centrifuge is too small, then this, this uh, gravity isn't uniform in the centrifuge. You feel that it's stronger uh, towards the outside of the centrifuge and weaker towards the axis of the centrifuge. And so if you sit in there and your feet are close to the center, say, of the centrifuge, so they are still in zero gravity and your head might be more than normal gravity. So it's a weird thing, right? Um, but if you make your centrifuge large enough so that compared to the size of a human body, its radius is, is large, then you will feel a uniform gravitational field. Uh, at the outskirts of the of the centrifuge. Yeah, the ones that that I had seen, you would like lie down, and so you would be lying flat, and then yeah. it would be spinning you around, and so it would just be about giving you that sense of gravity, the way you were talking about about yeah. early on. Um, yeah. I mean, do you think that until we get some form of artificial gravity through some kind of centrifugal force? we're going to suffer from these problems like spaceflight is just going to be an so. inherently damaging thing until we sort out artificial gravity yeah I, I believe so i believe so ultimately if you want to be for on the long term in in space you need artificial or, or inertial force generated gravity so now maybe going to mars it doesn't have to be done on the journey maybe it's okay to be in weightlessness for the eight months to get to Mars. But then once you're on Mars, you could build a ring on the Martian surface, you know, maybe with local materials even, so you don't have to bring the whole thing over there. And you know, then size and mass might not be such a big issue as on the actual flight. And you might be able, you might be able to create a centrifuge that simply adds um, 
two thirds of extra gravity because you only get one third on, on mass. And so rather than be hanging, you know, the, in there you would have a, a surface at the outside of this, that centrifuge that would be sort of that way inclined. So that the combined force vector of the centrifugal force and the, the martial gravity is exactly perpendicular to that floor. And you would have your beds and your, your rooms and your restaurants, everything there on that sort of inclined surface. And you, yeah, you'd live like, like, like here on Earth in terms of gravity. Right. It would, that sounds like when people think about like, oh, I would really love to go and live on Mars. You know, like, would you be okay to live in a centrifuge? Because that might be what life will have to be like, that you're going to live on this kind of uh, Ferris wheel that is constantly yeah. spinning and you're in a Ferris wheel car that is tilted over and you're, you know, as long as you're in the wheel, you're experiencing, but it's also shielded by rock. Like it, it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly to, to keep yeah. you safe oh, and look, um, strong on the Mars surface of Mars. Absolutely. I mean, Mars isn't our natural habitat. We, yeah. I, I think living in a centrifuge wouldn't be, wouldn't be an issue because if we think of a centrifuge, we think of a small enclosed space. If you have a large enough centrifuge, you know, let's say, say you, could, you could imagine any size really. I mean, this very room could be in a centrifuge without me knowing it. If it's a large enough centrifuge and, uh, you know, and very nice uh, uh, ball gearings and so on, and, you know, no, absolutely no, no friction, no vibrations, then I, I'm fine. It's like, it's like the question, you know, could you, could you be in a plane? Could you be living in a large plane? Um, it's constantly moving through the air, etc. I mean, yeah, because you wouldn't know it's it's constantly moving, or, or a ship, or any yeah. such things, really. Um, yeah. yeah. Or I, I guess until we get the um, the one G acceleration from your rocket engine to head off to Alpha Centauri, that now that would be the perfect way, like the expanse where you've you know you've got a high thrust rocket engine that's capable of giving you 1g and then it turns around to the halfway point and and slows down and gives you 1g on the on the descent as well that would be great exactly yeah yeah by the way you know before we spoke about uh how how quickly your bone and muscle mass deteriorates when you are in less than 1g and I, here's an idea that I always wanted to, you know, maybe once pitch to Elon Musk or someone like that. If you did the opposite, if you had a um, a centrifuge here on the planet that exposes you to constantly a little bit more than 1G, and it would be a huge thing. It would be, you know, a centrifuge that has 200 meters in diameter. It's this massive ring rotating quite slowly, but f out there you will feel maybe an extra half G-force. And it will be super smoothly suspended. You won't feel that you are rotating. And out there you have your restaurants, your fun parks, your offices, whatever you need. It's basically like a, a luxury hotel. And you go in there and you live in there for two weeks and you come back with extra bone and muscle and mass. And hmm. you'll be a fitter person because you're constantly exposed. That's you, interesting. It's a crazy idea. But you could imagine you go in at the center where, you know, because you're close to the axis of the center, you're extra force is very small. You can live a, a few days in 1.1 G and then if you feel comfortable, you go to 1.2 and then you're, you're at 1.5. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, no and then you come out and you just feel like a superhero, like you feel incredibly exactly. strong and everything is easy. Yeah. You jump really high. Um, exactly. what, what do you think is the limit? Someone actually asked me this question at one point, like yeah. what is the limit do you think that you could, you could exist for the long term in heavier gravity? Know. No idea. I have, I have no idea. Yeah, I, all right. know, I wouldn't want to think of an experiment to find out. Well, you just did. Yeah. You just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. you're, you're just proposing well, it. Yeah, 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 probably that. Yeah. Well, I imagine it would be much more than, than, than those levels, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not That's sure. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Daniel, thank you yeah. so much for taking the time to chat with me today. And thanks for sharing information about the, about the research and, uh, I hope you get a chance to fly some more on some parabolic flights. I hope I get a chance to fly on some parabolic flights. It sounds like a ball. And I hope terrifying. so too. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Cheers. Okay. So don't. So uh... you can get even more space news on my weekly email newsletter. 
I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word. There are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at university.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Vlad Shipelin, Jay Dennis, David Giltanen, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Andrew Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.